Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are delighted to be here with all of you virtually and in person, celebrating Making Americans, stories of historic struggles, new ideas, and inspiration in immigrant education. That book is written by Jessica Lander, and she is here tonight with us on the right. Um, Jessica is an award-winning teacher, writer, and author. She teaches history and civics to recent immigrant students in a Massachusetts public high school and has won numerous awards for her teaching, including being named a top 50 finalist for the Global Teacher Prize in 2021, wow. presented by the Department. <laughs> Jessica writes frequently about education policy and teaching. She's the author of the book we're celebrating tonight. She is the co-author of Powerful Partnerships, The Teacher's Guide to Engaging Families for Student Success, and the author of Driving Backwards. She's joined tonight by two folks who are connected to the Global Village Project. First is Crispin Ilombe Bulonja, who is the Global Village Project Student and Community Engagement Manager. He's on the left. Crispin is from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and became a U.S. citizen in July 2018. Before coming to GDP, he worked as a refugee resettlement case manager for five years and experiences where he learned a lot about working with refugee families. With this experience, Crispin now works to build strong bridges between GDP and families. His critical task is to connect family needs to the school and make sure that GDP meets the educational needs of students in a culturally responsive way. Crispin is also a Lutheran pastor and serves as mission developer of Good Samaritan Ministries in Stone Mountain, Georgia, working with refugees who are arriving in the U.S. to start a new life. Crispin speaks English, French, Swahili, Bengala, Kikongo, Karege, and Kibele, um, which is incredible. So welcome to Crispin. Thank you for being here. And finally, um, we are joined by Elise Witt, who is GVP's artist in residence. She heads up the music team, teaching weekly music classes, preparing student performances for authors' teas, and leading the Global Village Chorus, a select group of students who represent GVP in the larger community. Collaborating with classroom teachers, Elise also writes songs with students about academic subjects of study and areas of interest. In her life outside GDP, Elise's concerts of global, local, and homemade songs and her impromptu glorious chorus workshops create and connect singing communities around the globe. Born in Switzerland, raised in NC, and since 1977, making her home in Atlanta, she speaks five languages fluently, five languages fluently, and sings in over a dozen, and has been a cultural ambassador to South Africa, Italy, Nicaragua, Switzerland, and China. Elise's latest CD, We're All Born Singing, is her 12th recording for M World Records, and 20 plus of her songs have been arranged for choruses and choirs in the Elise Wynn Choral Series. To be singing all singing the Elise Witt songbook with 58 original songs, a few written with QVP students. So we have an illustrious group here with us tonight. I want to encourage our folks who are watching at home to feel free to put questions in the chat at any time. And for all of you who are here with us in the room, just know that there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So as you're listening, be sure to, to think about your questions. But now I'm going to kick it over to Elise and Jessica and Crispin. Uh, let's get on with the show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you all for having me um, down here. Uh, it's just such an honor, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, and it's an honor and excitement for multiple reasons. This bookstore is one that I found when my brother um, worked down in the area. Um, and I just remember walking in here and being drawn to all of the bookshelves and tables and picking up book after book and remembering it as such a magical, wonderful experience that I talked about for a long time after. And so it's just an honor for me to be able to be speaking here now, um, coming back so many years later. Um, and it's just a true honor for me to be able to speak about the work that Global Village Project does. Um, and I'm going to talk more about uh, how I found GVP and um, what I learned from them. Um, but it is 
Um, just really powerful to be here with these amazing educators who I got to learn from and they got to be my teachers. Um, and I'm so lucky that um, I had them as teachers. So I am excited to share with you a little bit about what I learned. Um, by way of extended introduction, I am, as was introduced before, I am a, a teacher of immigrant and refugee students of more than 30 different countries up in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is a city that's been home to newcomers for hundreds of years. And in my classroom, my students do amazing things, not just in my classroom, actually, really out in the community. Um, so just briefly telling you a little bit about what they do, because they are amazing, amazing young people. Um, we just finished up last week, because I'm still a teacher, <laughs> um, we just finished up a, a cookbook that we write. Um, so I teach U.S. history and civics, and we start off the year studying immigration of immigrants 100 years ago. But no study of immigration of 100 years ago is not complete with also studying the history of their own immigration here. Um, because, of course, my students are experts. And so each of them chooses a favorite family recipe. And they get that family recipe from their parents. And we write it down. And we translate it. And we make sure others can understand it. Um, so cook until done. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> and then they write stories about the, the histories, the memories of that food, and also their journeys to the US. Um, mm -hmm. And we all cook their food, and we bring it into the classroom. They cook it and learn it from their families. And we all taste that food. And then we uh, publish a book that we share out into the community. In a few months, we will, after studying the progressives, write our own op-eds and learn how to write op-eds on issues we care about in our communities, either here or back home in home country. And then we'll publish um, about 10 of those in the local newspaper and then in the school newspaper as well. And then in the spring, we will set off on a semester-long civics project to create community change, sustainable community change, um, working with politicians and local communities to uh, work on issues that my students care about from community safety to um, food insecurity. And so my students are remarkable. And I am just deeply, deeply inspired by them. And after working with them for many, many years, it more and more I wondered how we could do a better job in our schools to better support them, to better see all of their many strengths, um, and to make sure that we were creating schools that nurtured a strong sense of belonging. And so I actually I set out for a year for my classroom to go learn from schools across the country, including from the Global Village Project. Um, I set out to learn from the history of immigrant education across this country. Um, and I set out to learn from my own students, um, learning from them about their journeys. Now, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to read you a little section, and then we'll dive more into it. I figured it might make sense to start at the beginning. Can I eat with you? It was September 2015, and one of my students hovered hesitantly at the classroom's door. Gangly and shy, Wilson was apologetic. He had recently left his home in Puerto Rico, coming to live and study 1,700 miles north in Lowell, Massachusetts. Now surrounded by nearly 3,400 new peers, he felt lost. Though as Puerto Rican, he was an American citizen by birth, he still often felt as foreign as the many immigrant peers who filled his new classes. Nowhere did he feel he belonged. I too was new to the community, having recently come to Lowell High School to teach immigrant and refugee teenagers. That first month, a routine was born. Each day after my fifth class, the students streamed out. Wilson would shuffle in, carrying pizza, a sandwich, or sometimes a baked potato smothered in sour cream. My desk became our makeshift lunch table. Little by little, I grew to know Wilson. I asked about his favorite classes, his weekend excursions, what he missed most about the island. Then one Friday, during our lunch, he had a question for me. Pointing at my hands, he asked, how did you learn to use those? Nestled between my fingers were bamboo chopsticks. Wilson, I quickly learned, was mesmerized by all things Japanese. It was a love rooted in anime, which had spurred him to spend late nights reading Japanese history and practicing the katakana and hiragana alphabets. Over lunch, in a pause between classes, lesson planning, and grading, Wilson and I began speaking about learning languages and cultures. 
But our lunches did not remain one-on-one -on -one for long. Early in October, Wilson's classmate, Ni, a tall, serious Vietnamese girl, asked to join. Ni was quickly followed by Po, an inquisitive Korean refugee from Southeast Asia. More soon followed. By November, lunch in my classroom was bustling with students. Yemeni, Iraqi, and Lebanese girls drew center seats into a circle. A Liberian boy who loved history hung with a freckled Tanzanian boy near the door. In seats along the wall, a gaggle of Brazilian girls liked to linger. Two Cambodian girls sat side by side in front row desks. Students chatted, ate, hunched over unfinished homework, and peppered me with questions about history we had learned in class. Lunchtime also offered a master class in cuisines. Poe presented classmates with excruciating spicy fit, tiny fish. <laughs> Ni unpacked Vietnamese soup and passed around her spoon. One Lebanese student brought in flaky diamonds of baklava that left everyone licking fingers from their fingertips, flicking honey from their fingertips. I watched as students, tentative, curious, enthusiastic, tasted seaweed, egg curries, empanadas for the first time. I watched too as Wilson grew less reserved and more talkative, surrounded by his classmates from around the world. Almost everyone in the United States traces their origins elsewhere to ancestors who, whether by force or by choice, built new homes and new lives here. Some arrived 400 years ago and some four months ago. Some came seeking opportunities for themselves and for their children. Some came fleeing persecution. Many were brutally enslaved and forcibly transported across the Atlantic from the coast of West Africa. Even indigenous peoples whose forebearers have lived in America for millennia were violently displaced from their ancestral homes. The result is a country of unrivaled diversity. America's plurality has always been a source of strength and for many a point of pride. Our coins proclaim e pluribus unum, a motto that originally referred to the union of 13 colonies, but now speaks of the union of peoples drawn from a multitude of countries and cultures. The plaque beneath the Colossus in New York Harbor has for more than a century promised welcome to the globe's tired, poor, and huddled masses. And yet, that same America has long, also long fought to turn people away from its shores, especially based on where they come from, what religion they practice, or whom they love. Claiming that new rivals would take jobs from Americans already here or asserting that newcomers were racially inferior, the United States has excluded them from schools and from jobs. Suspicious of their customs and skeptical of their allegiance, states have passed laws banning them from speaking languages other than English, and people have pressured them to abandon their culture and religious heritage. Despite the tension between welcome and exclusion, the country has always relied and will continue to rely on new arrivals. They enrich America in hundreds of ways. They bring their talent, determination, and resilience to our shores. Given the importance of newcomers to this country, a critical question for our future is, how do we ensure that immigrants feel safe, supported, and valued, with a chance to put down roots and build new futures so that they can become full participants in their new home? In short, what does it take to make Americans? <laughs> so that's the open. And so what I did is I set off to go learn from others. And I realized pretty quickly that there were three, three types of stories I was seeking. I needed to learn from the past. I needed to understand the key moments in our history, the stories, the intimate stories, uh, at the heart of landmark Supreme Court cases, federal laws, and movements that have transformed schools today for immigrant students. I also needed to learn from the present. What was going on in schools and programs today across the country that was working to support immigrant students? And most importantly, perhaps, I needed to learn from the personal. I needed to learn from young people themselves about their experiences of coming to this country and their experiences of our schools. And so I set out to do that. I set out to learn from the past. I'll start there. And 
there are some remarkable stories. Um, stories that I'm embarrassed I did not know. Stories like how in 1920, more than 20 states in the US banned the teaching of German and in many cases, other foreign languages. And stories of a teacher in a parochial school, in a one-room schoolhouse in rural Nebraska, who in the spring of 1920 was arrested one afternoon for teaching an 11-year-old boy the Bible in German. And how he didn't back down and he took his case up through the courts and in 1923 enshrined the right for young people to learn languages other than English. There's the story of the Mendez family, who, when they went to enroll their children in a school in Westminster, California, were told no. They had to go to the segregated Mexican school down the road, because at the time in California, schools were segregated with white Mexican schools. And how they did not back down. And they organized with others, uh, other families, and they hired a civil rights lawyer and they sued the school districts in the Westminster area. And their case went up through the courts and ultimately helped to desegregate schools in California. And then was the stepping stone a number of years later for Brown v. Board of Education. And there's the story of four families in Texas. And that story I'd like to share just the opening with. The sun had yet to surface when Lydia and Jose Lopez gently shook their five children from their slumber, dressed them in their Sunday best, and tucked the family into their white Dodge Monaco. The sedan was piled high with books, clothes, pots, even the family's small TV. But the Lopez's were not embarking on a road trip. Their destination was a mere two blocks away at the Federal District Courthouse in Tyler, Texas. Alfredo, nine, and the oldest, remembers little. It was a Friday, the week after the start of school, the year 1977. The little black-haired boy should have been entering second grade. His sister should have been starting first. But just as classes were set to resume, their parents received a letter informing them that tuition was required if they wished their children to study in the public schools. For the Lopez family, the fee was unaffordable. Just over two years earlier and more than 200 miles south in Austin, the legislature had revised the state's education code. But before the final vote was cast, the border city of Brownsville slipped in a provision that at the time went largely unnoticed. Going forward, public schools would no longer be obligated to educate their community's undocumented children. And the state would contribute no funds to support those children's academic futures. Public schools were left with a choice, cover the cost themselves, charge tuition, or exclude such students altogether. In the blistering summer heat of 1977, the Tyler School Board, arguing that the city was on the precipice of becoming, quote, a haven for undocumented families, voted to charge tuition for every student who could not prove legal residence. $1,000 per child. Mm roughly one-fourth of most undocumented Texans' annual income. The city of Tyler in the eastern corner of Texas was founded in the mid-1800s, built by enslaved Black Americans, and named for a U.S. president who initiated the annexation of the Lone Star State. Surrounded by vibrant blooms, it was a city that proudly proclaimed itself the rose capital of America. And it was here, in 1969, where Jose Lopez found work tending rosebuds after crossing the southern border. <clears throat> Within a few years, he sent for his wife and then for his children, who left their home in the small Mexican city of Jalpa and traveled hundreds of miles north to reunite. On arriving in the United States, Alfredo was enrolled in elementary school and attended dutifully until, in the summer of 1977, the school board changed its policy. Of the city's nearly 16,000 students, less than 60 were undocumented, and they were suddenly ineligible to study in the city's schools. Growing up in Mexico, neither Jose nor Lydia Lopez had been able to stay long in school. Their families needed them in the fields, but for their children, they wished for a different future. And so, 
A week later, a little before 6 a.m., the Lopez family pulled into the parking lot of the federal district courthouse, the sky just beginning to bloom pink. There they met three other undocumented families. Together, they had made the perilous choice to sue the city's schools. It was a decision the parents made knowing what might happen. That was why the night before, Lydia and Jose Lopez had packed the Dodge Monaco to the brim. As Lydia would recall years later, in walking into that courthouse, they were prepared to be immediately arrested and deported. But for their children, it was a risk they chose to take. Mm. Alfredo's family, and I spoke with Alfredo for this story, um, Alfredo's family and the three other families who bravely sued the Tyler school system, their case also went up to the Supreme Court. And their case, Tyler B. Doe, is the case that enshrines the right today for all undocumented children to have access to K-12 public education in this country. These stories are powerful. Um, and that was one part of what I needed to seek out, is these stories of history that I did not know and many people that I talked with didn't know, but that have transformed our schools and made them places that are more accepting, more welcoming. Um, and they are only there because of the courage of many, many people from pastors to uh, teachers to families to students to community organizers. There really is a role for everyone um, to presidents. Um, in addition to the stories of the past, I, of course, also needed those stories of the present. And so I set out talking to educators to hear who was doing innovative, exciting, creative work to support immigrant students? And I profile in the book seven remarkable programs from a single classroom in Fargo, North Dakota, to an entire school district of 126 schools in uh, Guilford, North Carolina. And also, a really remarkable program just down the road. And I wanted to spend some time talking about that remarkable program that I learned from. Um, so I figured I'd open with, um, just to get us started into that conversation uh, in a moment, um, with the opening of that chapter. The streets of Clarkston, Georgia were dark and almost entirely empty as we bounced along back roads in a small school bus early one morning. In the driver's seat sat Crispin Ilonde Ilonga, right there. <laughs> the school support specialist for the Global Village Project, GDP, which is the only school in the United States dedicated to teaching refugee girls. We pulled up alongside an apartment complex. Remember this? Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> and out of the dark, two girls, one Syrian, one Congolese, emerged and quietly boarded. A third was missing. Crispin picked up his phone. Salam alaikum. On the other end of the line, the girl's father explained she was late, but he would drive her. We continued on. At the next stop, three girls bounded onto the bus. You're late, Mr. Crispin, they accused in mock indignation. <laughs> Crispin chuckled. Good morning. I think I'm exactly one minute late. The girls laughed as they took their seats. For many of the students at GVP, Crispin is more than a bus driver or a math teacher, one of his other roles at the school. He is like a family member. He knows the girls' birthdays, their favorite school subjects, the songs they like to sing, he has sat in their living rooms and their family's numbers are logged in his phone. For 15 young women, a third of the GDP school, he was their case manager when they were resettled in the United States. As girls board the bus, he can tell me the exact day and time each landed in America. He knows because he was there to greet them at the Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport. 
As they buckle up, Crispin took out his phone to, talk, to call two Congolese sisters. Pujambo, his Swahili is warm and expressive. Are you ready for school? Have you eaten enough ugali? The sisters, Naomi and Kasifa, have joined the school a month ago after arriving in the country two months earlier. When, in their first few days at GVP, they failed to meet the bus, Crispin went to their apartment to collect them. On the fourth morning, he suggested they set an alarm. <laughs> Naomi didn't know how, so he taught her. He promised, too, to call every morning. Never before had either sister attended school. Not here. Not in the Ugandan refugee camp. Not in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But soon after the girls arrived in the United States, public school officials, the officials placed 17-year-old Naomi in 11th grade. Understanding little and unable to communicate with either her peers or her teachers, she decided to drop out. Her mother needed help. Her younger siblings needed food, clothing, and money for school supplies. She planned to get a job in the nearby chicken factories. That was when Kristen learned of the new family. He went to meet them, and soon after, he introduced the two oldest sisters to GDP. Although dubious about American schools, Naomi decided to enroll. Naomi and her sister were waiting for us when we pulled up to the row of brick apartments. Two Burmese sisters and another Congolese student scampered on just behind them. As the sky ripened to peach, we headed back across town lines to Decatur, the wealthier suburb of Atlanta. Two of the girls were blasting Bollywood on their headphones, singing along in Hindi. See, Mr. Crispin, we are learning a new language. <laughs> Crispin laughed, a rumbling chuckle. When we reached school, the girls piled out singing. The side of the bus was painted in bold purple letters. The Global Village Project, one girl at a time. So I want to mostly open this up for a discussion, um, but I want to just briefly tell you, um, because I probably won't read, we'll see about timing, um, uh, a small bit of the last section. We'll see. Maybe I will near the end. Um, the last section, which uh, for me is the heart of this book, is the personal. Um, and so in the book, you will find seven stories of seven remarkable young people from around the world who I have the honor of being their teacher. And they are just truly beautiful humans. Um, and they generously and courageously allowed me to share parts of their story and their journey in the books that we could learn from them. So depending on timing, I might read you a section of one of those stories um, to introduce you to one of my remarkable young people. But I, I wanted to stop there um, because it, for me as a, a teacher, teaching can often feel so isolating. We're in our classrooms um, with our students, which is wonderful, but we rarely have time to learn from others um, in the field. And it was such an exhilarating year for me when I was traveling um, to be able to learn from others, to be able to ride a bus um, very, very early in the morning when the sky was still dark, um, and sit with Crispin, um, to be able to sit in Elise's music classes and sing alongside students, um, and to be able to sit with students in their classes, to work with them, to walk down the street to get lunch at the college right nearby. Um, and that was so powerful for me. Um, I think there's so much we have to learn from GVP and so many other schools. And it's really about how we connect them and learn from them together. And it's not just for educators, it's all about the communities that are a part of it. And I think GVP is such a perfect example of the community coming together in support of a school um, and being a part of the, the pulse and the heartbeat of that school. And so I figured we might open it up for some questions and then maybe also some conversation about um, the work you are doing. Um, but I wanted to pause there and might return to one more reading later. Um, but wanted to pause. So 
I don't know if we want to open up for questions or to talk a little bit about their amazing work. They do incredible work. If you haven't had a chance to be in the classrooms, I encourage you to. Um, but maybe we can open it up for a few questions and really have a conversation. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm gonna I, bring the mic to you. Oh, okay. so Um, my name is Olivia. Thank you so much for being here and for reading. Um, I was wondering, uh, during your year of researching and traveling around the country and seeing all of these different classrooms, what surprised you the most? Many, many, many things. Um, I think the one that strikes me about GVP and that struck me, and I can't remember if I shared it with you too, I shared it with Amy about like, a couple days in was laughter. Um, <laughs> that it, there is uh, just a remarkable amount of laughter in the halls of GDP. <laughs> and it was it was something that it took me a couple of days to identify as how odd that was. Um, I don't think I have ever heard so much laughter in a school. Um, and it was not the laughing at someone, it was the laughing with. Um, that learning, the learning that I saw at GBP was joyous. And that's a powerful thing to begin with when you're talking about high school. Um, because high school is hard for many reasons. Um, so the fact that there is so much laughter and so much support of generous laughter, it speaks to a community that is supporting each other and is learning together and being willing to take risks together. I think on top of that, when we think about girls like Naomi, who I'm speaking about, who are perhaps coming to a formal school for the first time, that's really challenging. It's really, really hard to do that. And there are a lot of frustrating days. Um, and that can be demoralizing. Um, it can and does take a ton of bravery. But despite all of that, to hear so much laughter in the school, so much joyousness in the school, was really beautiful. And I think that, to me, for GVP was the most surprising thing. Um, that it had created such a community where the halls were just filled, filled with laughter. Um, and I think the other part of that is filled with love. Great question. Please know that Olivia is our English language uh, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't met her because she was not there when you were there, but she's been with us a couple of years and she's an amazing, wonderful teacher who generously <laughs> shares her classroom with our music classes. But um, we've been talking about you actually um, all year because she was inspired by your cookbooks oh, yes. and thinking that um, perhaps that would be a really um, fun project for us to undertake. We should talk and share the, the talk. curriculum with you. Absolutely, let's talk, 100%. Mm. Uh, I don't know, do you laughter? That's the thing that strikes me about GBP. I don't know about the two of you. Um, and I would like to add that it's a real too much laughter <laughs> from the bus to the classrooms to the I'm a Scott. But I want to to ask this question: Why? Why too much laughter at the GDP? Why? <laughs> and I think if we are here today is to find the reason of that laughter. And the reason is clear in the book. Because in the book, you put a real connection between learning, education, and feeling safe and home. These girls, after being in refugee camps, in other schools where they did not feel home, when they come to GDP, they find that loving space. And many times you were saying, 
they feel like there is a family. And when you have, I mean, uh, when you read that piece, so I saw the two sisters, they were saying, see, because they, they found themselves in those uh, stories. Those are their stories. That's, and, and for those who are used to GDP, that's what I call the GDP magic. Yes. Magic. So the laughter is the expression, the result of being that special school where the girls, they find home, they feel safe, and they open themselves to teachers. And I would say, not only laughter, but a lot of hugs. A lot of hugs <laughs> everywhere. So that's the secret. And I want to, to say again, on behalf of those girls, those families, thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you for your time, your love, your compassion, your contribution to making Americans. I loved the, the, the word making Americans, not becoming Americans. Because you may become American, but if you don't feel safe, if you, you don't feel welcome, things will not be as good as the level of laughter and hugs. So thank you so much. I also want to add the idea of transformation in there because it doesn't start out like that at the beginning of the year. And I know that um, this year I noticed something really remarkable yesterday. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had in one of the classes some very um, just hard meetings of girls that were from different cultures and name calling and just, you know, a lot of just not understanding each other and wanting to be, you know, safe in their own culture. Yesterday, um, we walked to Agnes Scott College for lunch. It's been several years since we were able to do that, so we love doing it again because of the pandemic we weren't able to. But yesterday, I got to walk to lunch with the girls, and I saw four girls, two and two, from very different cultures who were very antagonistic with each other at the beginning of the year, walking together arm in arm and looking at each other's eyes and talking about the eyes and the shape of their eyes and looking like, and laugh, laughing, of course. But I mean, they were having such a good time and loving each other so much. And it was like, wow, I remember y'all like a few weeks ago. I mean, we had the, I mean, it was hard, right? We have other teachers here as well. Um, and, and to see that and, feel that and walk with them like that. And it was just beautiful. And that's what happens, that transformation that happens over the course of the year of being together and becoming family, becoming that, that family. And we have the, the, the saying, of, you know, once you come to GDP, you are always part of the family, right? Well, you are well. part of the family. Everyone who, who comes to volunteers is part of that GVP family. So um, there is definitely magic that happens, not overnight, but over time and through so many different ways. And I think the question for me then is, and this is the question that I came, one of the questions I came away with after my time at GVP is why is there not more laughter in other schools? And how can we create more laughter? And it comes down to Kristen, the things you were mentioning of, creating safe, loving environments where students are supported. Um, but it would be so beautiful and magical if we heard the same quantities, exuberant quantities of laughter in other schools, that it wasn't such uh, a surprise. Coming back to your question, um, that thing that really stood out to me, of, I, I have never heard so much laughter and so much love in a school. <coughs> Uh, you, you talked about your search, taking a year in searching, and you heard about what you discovered at GDP. 
I'm curious, in starting your search, what struck you? How did GBP come to your attention? What struck you that you decided in the whole country that's one of the places I want to visit? Um, so a, a friend, so basically when I was seeking out where, where should I go, I, I asked everyone. So um, lots of teachers and then teachers connected me to other teachers and researchers and nonprofits working in the ed space and I, hundreds of calls. Um, many people didn't have suggestions, they hadn't heard of schools that they were excited about. Um, and then there were some, and so then I started just traveling. If uh, a school would let me come visit for a day, great, I will be there, I will get on a plane, I will go. And so um, generously, many, many schools uh, opened their doors and their classrooms, so I came and visit. Um, and so a friend of mine who used to be connected to the GVP community, and I guess always is, because once you're part of the family, you're always part of the family, so still is, but it's not local, and is up in Massachusetts where I live, um, had first mentioned GVP to me. Um, and so she made the connection. I then cold emailed being like, hi, I'm a teacher. Can I come down and visit? I'm trying to write a book. Um, and um, the leadership team generously let me come down. And I actually, I had the opportunity to visit for one of the afternoon teas. Um, and it was beautiful. Um, and I spent a day sitting in on classrooms, um, hearing that laughter, um, talking with some of the teachers, um, listening to the music that was performed um, at the tea. Um, talking with Crispin um, down in the auditorium below and the, the stories and the approach and the work that I was seeing was really, really inspiring to me um, and knew that the, the book is trying to show stories of a whole wide range of approaches um, for different communities so that it's not saying that like this one approach is the approach that we should do across the country. Um, as I said, it profiles a single classroom to an entire district, um, but each has a really interesting idea and a really creative approach and seeing success. And uh, there is no school like GVP in the country. There should be more, but there is no school like GVP in the country. And so knew from one day's visit that I needed to come back. Um, and they generously said I could, <laughs> um, which is, is a big thing. I know as a teacher, um, it is it takes a, a lot of courage to open up your doors and your classrooms to someone who is writing about your students and a place you care about. So I know the the amount of trust that was placed in me in inviting me into the space and so honored um, to have been given that trust. I have a question. Yeah. So we we are we are a tiny school. Um, we right now have 42 students, um, and I think that's part of what um, makes it so beautiful. We have, I think, over 100 volunteers that work with us in various ways. Um, but I'm curious how, when you, if you visited a whole school district, that same magic, how, how you know, we're a huge country. We're have many, many schools of different sizes and different shapes and different everythings. How, how can we open up our, our school system, our education system to, I feel like it's getting more and more industrialized, like everything, you know, in this country. And how can we come back to this in, in large settings? So, I think this isn't a, a full solution, but I, I don't have a full solution, but I think it is going to come to making connections um, and being able to learn from each other. So I, I think about all I have drawn just as a single teacher, setting aside the book from being able to visit so many schools. And 
in addition to writing my notes for the book, I was like also had a side list of things I want to try in my classroom. Um, because as I said near the beginning, teaching is often very isolating and you don't get to learn from others. And I think one thing that really struck me as I traveled is the amount of times I would be talking with amazing educators in a school or in a district, and they would be doing really powerful work. And then they would be, well, we're challenged in this area. We're struggling to maybe it's thinking about complex language or maybe thinking about partnering with families in a, a deeper way. And be like, well, I just talked to a school last week that's doing really powerful work. Can I connect the two of you? And we exchange some emails and they, they set up visits. Um, I would like to see that at a national level. I would like to try to help and get others to help make those connections because there are such powerful examples in our communities that are mostly not known about. Um, sometimes within a community not known and sometimes outside the community not known, let alone across state lines. And so I think the ways we're going to do this is by being able to learn from each other. Can we send teachers or district leaders to go visit schools and sit in and talk with educators? I know the, the district that I uh, profile in the book, that was from Myra Hayes, an amazing Yale director in uh, Guilford, going to a conference and learning about an approach that was happening in New York. And she came away, she had been a district leader for more than a decade, and they had good results, but she was not satisfied. And she came away really excited about what she heard what was happening in schools in New York. And she came back to her district with a proposal, and then she worked with that team, which was uh, um, doing work in it was a relationship between an educator and a professor, um, one in New York, one in California. And they implemented at scale because she had created a community of educators all working to get together across 126 schools. And they're doing really, really powerful work, but it was because she learned about what was happening somewhere else. And then had the community of practice that she had set up to be able to build on that and bring those ideas in. And was able to partner with those people from New York who then helped her do that. And so I think it's going to be about building connections um, and making sure that we can learn from each other, which also means trying to find and identify powerful programs um, so that we can learn from them. Um, and that won't be the full solution, but I think it's a really powerful starting place. My question was actually related since you clearly have such success and there's another example near the Fuji's Academy, have the public education systems in Fulton and DeKalb come to you asking for advice on how they could be more welcoming? Very good question and very simple, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and uh, I mean, I don't think, I don't think they do, no. And it's like um, they feel they are so powerful and they think we need them, not the opposite. Um. So they expect GVP or Fuji Academy to go to them for advice, for calendar, for everything. But um, trying to think about the greater good of students and to see how they can adapt, adjust to this immigrant uh, kids coming to America, that has never been their question. One thing they try to do is to hire people who can speak their languages, but adjust the, the system that has never happened. As the book is saying, Nahomi is 70 and who cannot even read the alphabet, she goes there. How old are you? 17, 11th grade. Immediately. And they don't care. They will start sending uh, emails to the parents who cannot read, uh, calling and leaving uh, some, some voicemails. That, and I think um, I have been praying to see, is it possible 
to be more flexible in education, to reverse so that the school has to meet the student where, where she is, where he is, rather than a student trying to work like a devil in a blessed water from zero to 11th grade. And that's what GDP does. And as the book said, we don't have grades, we have forms. We meet the students who are from pre-K and within three years we have to make them eighth grade. So, and as, as you said, it is possible to create ways to share, to collaborate, to ask and to learn. Because if um, educators don't learn from uh, each other, you are convinced in your small area or this or that you are the best. And we see that even that kind of competition between Dekal and Fulton, when you come from Fulton, they don't. So why we are all educating, we are making Americans, we are making the leaders of tomorrow. Why can't we build strong and common foundations to prepare a better future for these kids? Hi, um, this is more of a comment and an invitation, but bouncing off of the notions of networking and also building foundations and connections. If anybody's interested uh, in great double headers, November 5th just happens to be the welcome walk for Global Village Project. So we have nine from Refuge Coffee House in um, Clarkston. And I, do you remember where the end point is? The school. The school. The school. The school. <laughs> so it is at the school, which is, as you know, right down the street. Well, that very same day happens to be Karis's birthday. Oh. So you all could come right on over here after we, of course, stop and shop at Amani's table, <laughs> and then come right on over here and celebrate our birthday with us. Mm -hmm. That's I did. Yep. Yeah. I have a question about your how you got into the refugee education field, and a kind of a double question about um, the level of English your students have, and when they come, are they all different? And also, are there any classes that are that are school wide that are not just just immigrant? Children. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so I, um, so I teach at Lowell High School, yes, which um, is the it's actually it's the first integrated high school in the country. Um, integrated in uh, conception in the 1830s, um, and it is one of the largest in the state. I'm guessing one of the largest in the country with 3,400 students in one um, three buildings. Um, so. We have a very rich um, and vibrant immigrant community, um, and we have classes. There are many different approaches to thinking about educating um, and supporting immigrant students, recent immigrant students. Um, and so we have some sheltered classes that are fully for students still working on uh, mastering English. Um, so my students mostly are in classes fully with other students still mastering English. Um, and then as their English levels that were tested every year um, uh, progress, then they move into classes with either students who have moved out of Yale classes or um, American-born non-local students. Um, and so they might be in a range of both, they might though stay in Yale classes um, throughout their high school experience, depending on um, how much English they have when they came to the country. Um, you asked about levels. Um, I got students who showed up a couple months ago, and I have students who've been here five years. Um, I have students who um, are, with, I feel probably right at home at GDP, um, who've had um, uh, interrupted education, either because of war or other conflicts. Um, 
and I've had students who have um, been able to go to formal school in their entire life. Um, so I have a, a wide range. I have um, a, a lot of refugee students and also uh, immigrants um, who are coming here by choice um, and moving for economic reasons. Um, it is it's beautiful in its diversity. And, really and how did I get yeah. to, um, so I started teaching right out of college. Um, and I started teaching abroad, first in Thailand and then in Cambodia. Um, and when um, I was looking to transition to high school, I've been in the U.S. for a while, then um, I was looking at a range of schools, and um, Lowell really drew me for the vibrancy of its immigrant community. It's also the second largest Cambodian population um, outside of Cambodia. Um, and it was really uh, two heads of department that drew me to Lowell. Um, so my two heads of department, in uh, Yale and in history, um, drove down on a Saturday morning, uh, met me halfway between where my house is and where our school is, and we met at a coffee shop along the train tracks, and they talked to me for an hour and a half about their school um, and their community, and it was that conversation that was transformative, um, and a real testament to them in driving down on a Saturday to Saturday morning to talk to a prospective teacher um, and try to encourage them to come to the school. Um, it was, the, and they have been just tremendously supportive of my students and our work on the classroom ever since. Um, so that's how I got to work um, back in 2015. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm a new volunteer in GVP, and uh, when I'm in social studies, I can hear Elise in the class singing, you know, I'm thinking about laughter and the joy and the breathing that, that music and singing comes, you know, um, comes with it. But I was interested in the role of arts in general and the programs that you've seen. Do they have other... Um, you know, music classes like GVP has, or do they have any community-based arts programs with artists in the community? And what do you think the role of art is? I feel like at least you should take part of that question, uh -huh. the role of art. So I want to send that part to you. Um, thinking about programs that I've seen, um, so one program that's really powerful that I've seen that looks um, that works uh, in the arts and the writing arts um, is the school and the classroom I mentioned in Fargo, North Dakota, which um, Leah Jolke, who is a, a nationally and globally recognized teacher, um, works with her newcomers to write books about their migrations mm -hmm. uh, here. And so they do the Journey to America project, as she's named it. And um, they share stories of self and share stories of their journeys. And they edit and they edit and they edit. And then they publish those into books that they then share into their community. Um, they do public readings. They've done professional development with educators. Um, they sometimes talk at elementary and middle schools. Um, and I, I think that's been a powerful example of a different type of art. Um, mm -hmm. It's not music or visual, um, like a painting, but um, the writing arts and a way for that to be both a space for students to share and maybe to process um, stories of um, journey sometimes, and also to share and build connections and community. Um, it's so important for our communities to be learning from um, our young newcomers. Um, that's a really powerful example, but I want to throw part of that over to Elise to talk about arts and the importance of arts in education. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I started out, or I spent a, a lot of um, my career as an artist in residence, and I would travel to different places and work for a few weeks or even a few months living in Milledgeville, Georgia, or uh, somewhere in South Carolina, whatever. And one of the questions that I always ask the teachers is, what is something that is hard for you to teach? What is something that's hard for students to grasp? Let's write a song about it. And the students, we write a song together. And 
I mean, I know of songs that we wrote that have like 17 verses and the students remember the entire thing because they made it. And I think that's part of um, part of what it is with, with the arts is that we're creating something. Um, we learn songs. I, I think music is a great way to learn language. I myself, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country at age four and I did not speak in the classroom for six months. And then I spoke English. And I think, I think that sounds weird, but I think that's normal. I mean, I think a lot of kids do that especially small kids. Um, but I, I came home um, in like December and I told my parents that we had learned some Christmas songs and I sang to them and they said, well, why are you singing about red pants and bathtubs? And I said, well, it goes, <laughs> so I was what I hear, right? But um, <laughs> but for me, um, music also helps with the sound of the language. So it, it's one thing to learn, you know, definitions and how to construct the language, sentences, and all that. But I'm like passionate about the sound of language. I am trying to learn some Amharic, some Kikongo, some Swahili, some, you know, from my students. And, and I always ask them, um, say it again, say it again. And like in Karen, I will never say it correctly, but I keep trying. And they'll, I say, how do you say good morning? And they say, hola, que. And I say, Polake, and they go, Polake, <laughs> Polake, and they go, Polake. <laughs> but, um, but that idea of, of listening, listening deeply, and hearing the music in language, I think it really, um, it brings it into a deep place um, that we don't forget. And I, I love meeting students you know, that we had like years and years ago and they remember, you know, some like silly, hilarious song that we learned or that we wrote together because it never leaves us. Um, the same with visual art, dance, putting it into our bodies. Actually, we move a lot in music class um, because I feel like um, the music is in our bodies and you love to dance. I know, Mr. Chris, we had a discussion about dancing a minute ago. Um, but just getting language and communication into our whole selves, into our bodies moving, um, into our ears of that, the, the delicacies of what things sound like. Um, and singing, it's amazing the pronunciation that people have when they sing something because they're imitating what they heard. Mm -hmm. And then when they're like reading the book or something, they will have a very strong accent from their own language. But they, then they're singing some popular American song sounding exactly like Janelle Monet or whoever it is they're listening <laughs> to, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that, that idea of imitation, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but Obviously, um, all of the arts, I think, bring us closer to language, closer to understanding, and closer to each other. You know, singing together, the vibrations that we make together. Um, yeah. I also want to add that, as you know, with our immigrant refugee girls, one big issue is the language barrier. And for me, for my understanding, the art goes beyond the language. Somebody cannot speak English, but somebody can sing in English. Mm -hmm. Somebody can express himself herself, uh, I mean, by drawing, by painting, by, because the language allows you to express something that the language is not able to express. And I think coming together, teaching to the girls to sing together. That will even break the distinction she's 
come from Syria, from Afghanistan, together. They can sing, they can mingle, they can tell together. And when they come to that harmony, through singing, dancing, they feel being together, being family, and that will create that safe place that will allow education for our girls. So it's hard to believe what we're already nearing time. So Jessica, I wonder if you just could close us out with any any kind of, you know, anything that you want us to know about the book and about your experience with GVP that maybe you didn't get to say yet. Um, well, I just want to close one with thanking all of you for coming tonight, um, both in person and virtually. Um, to, to hear about these stories. I have had the honor of sitting with these stories now for three years um, as I've learned them and, and written about them. Um, and they're just so incredibly inspiring to me and I hope you find them inspiring. I think we have so much to learn from these stories of the past, um, these stories of the present, um, these stories of the personal of our students and our young people. Um, and I think it's really, it's going to take all of us together reimagining immigrant education. Um, and I think the, the research in the book and the stories in the book are, are true to that, that there is a role for everyone in the community, um, from new teachers, from um, community organizers, to parents, to um, members of religious communities, to all the way up to U.S. presidents. Um, and um, it's a... a, a um, something that I hope you will join in, um, that we need everyone involved. And um, if you haven't gotten involved in GPP's work, there are many, many ways to volunteer. Um, yes, I know yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are um, many volunteers or uh, people already involved in the community, but if you're not, you uh, definitely should be. Um, uh, I just, I feel so lucky to have been able to sit in music classes, um, and it is a full body experience, um, and there is a lot of laughter and there's a lot of singing, and, um, I feel so privileged to have sat, um, with Kristen on the bus and in classes with him, um, and to learn from both of their wisdom and the wisdom of all the teachers at GVP who open their classrooms, uh, who share their stories, who share their work with me. Um, so it is just such a, an honor to be able to share some of the stories in this book, and I have so much more to learn from them. And so excited, as Elise said, that. Once you're in the GP community, you never leave it. Um, so I'm really excited about that because I'm um, looking forward to the next time I can sit in both of their classrooms. So thank you all for coming. I hope you find this work. Thank you all so much. So we're going to um, encourage our folks who are watching at home to click this teal button to buy Making Americans Stories of Historic Struggles, New Ideas, and Inspiration of Immigrant Education um, from Kara's Books. You can do that right here in your browser. And for our folks who are here with us physically in the space, if you don't already have your copy of your book, there are plenty more up front, and Jessica is here to sign them, so please get your copy signed. So good night to our friends watching at home.